I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. And this is Currents. Tensions are high in one Brooklyn neighborhood over plans to build a mosque there. We'll talk to both sides. Certainly the community has the right to air their opinions. I would hope that those opinions would be based not on, on ignorance, and fear or prejudice, but on true community concern. A parenting handbook from a unique perspective. And you may not believe what one young girl did to help the people of Haiti. $600 were meant for my birthday. I was going to have a party with my friends, but I thought the people in Haiti needed this more. Well, good evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Religious prejudice may be more widespread than many people realize and targeted against one group in particular. According to a recent survey, 43% of Americans, that's almost half, see that they have some prejudice against Muslims. Now that is more than any other religious group. The survey was conducted by Gallup and the Coexist Foundation. Now this is an issue that may have been on the minds of many residents in one New York neighborhood. Our Natalia Ortiz is here and she has more on the story. Natalia. Thank you. Matt, Francesca, a house of worship should bring people together, but that's not what's happened in one corner of Brooklyn where a proposed house of worship is tearing people apart because it's a mosque. This lot has been the subject of much controversy lately, and the residents in Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn, have a lot to say on the matter. It's because this stretch of Voorhees Avenue between East 28th and 29th Streets is the proposed site for a new mosque that could be built by the end of this year. Not everyone is happy about it. Stephen Paskin lives across the street. It's difficult enough to park as it is now. And then if they, you know, they build the mosque, where are all the people coming to the mosque? Where are they going to park? But this Muslim man thinks there's more to the opposition than just concern about crowded streets. First of all, we are in New York. Let's put it that way. And you see the traffic all over. You see the parking issues. It's all over. So nothing will be added. And these people who are going to use this place is the community members. And to be honest, we're disappointed because it, it goes to a point where there is racial and there is uh, something that's not fits on this great nation, including the area itself. Earlier this week, the controversy drew about 250 people, the largest crowd anyone could remember, to the local community board's monthly meeting. A lot of the comments focused on anxieties about having such a large Muslim worship space in the area. Grigory Kalma insisted during the meeting that the concerns had nothing to do with religion, but afterward, he said that some of his neighbors are worried. Oh, it's a traffic, parking, noise. Also our bigger issue, I don't tell about myself, but I know so many people very fear about Muslim people. If they move to neighborhood, so many people start selling their houses. And their, our houses will go down tremendously. Father Joseph Grimaldi is from St. Mark's, Sheep's Head Bay's Catholic parish. People have um, the right to freedom of religion and to worship their God. Um, so certainly the church's stand on it would be a freedom for these people to, um, to build a house of worship wherever. Um, the, I guess the corollary to it though would be, um, is it being built in the right area? And certainly the community has the right to air their opinions. I would hope that those opinions would be based not on, on ignorance, uh, fear or prejudice, but on true community concern. But the man who's behind the project said that he thinks opposition to the mosque boils down simply to ignorance, and he's out to shatter any misconceptions. There, there's so much uh, Islamophobia going on, there's so much hate for Islam going on. Uh, we want to know them that we are, we are American. Yes, we are Muslim, but we are American, and, and, and we want, we want ev everything that every American wants. While not everyone in Sheep's Head Bay wants a mosque in this location, barring any last-minute roadblocks, the plans to build it here will go forward. A lot of strong feelings there, and I think everyone in the community would like the conversation to continue and maybe bridge some of the differences. Yeah, definitely a, a very contentious issue there, and uh, you know, one that I, I think for, for years and years and years people have fought and died because yeah. of religion. I mean, it's been something that has been dividing people instead of uniting them for too long. Unfortunately, this is not new, as, as Francesca pointed out off camera to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, for thousands of years it's been an issue, and people have gone to war over it, died over it, and it's uh, it, 
you know, the fact that it's against this one particular group, mm -hmm. um, obviously our recent history with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and all of that is, um, I'm sure, a bit of what's in people's minds yeah. uh, when right. they're, you know, sort of making this assessment. But truly, we must coexist as people. Yeah, and there's more of that going on right now in, in Malaysia as well right. with the Allah ruling there. We'll have more on that actually coming up later in okay. the show. And also in Egypt as well, there's some religious violence happening. It's really all over the place. And uh, it's also here, I mean, pertaining to America, it's what makes America, mm -hmm. America. You know, the yeah. fact that we somehow always figure it out, but at the beginning, it's always very difficult. And this has been, you know, historically in our country as well, something that we've had to deal with. Right. New people, new races, new religious religions. Religious freedoms. Right. Yeah, and exactly. We are indeed in the yeah. city of immigrants. That's so. right. right. The two-edged sword of being a melting pot <laughs> there. Thank Thanks, you so Natalia. much, Natalia. Thank you. Well, stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead when we return. We have the day's headlines. Including President Obama promises to plug ahead on health care reform. We'll tell you what he said in last night's State of the Union address. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up a little later, a local student makes a big sacrifice for the people of Haiti. You won't want to miss that one. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. In his first State of the Union address last night, President Obama spent most of his time talking about the nation's economic woes. The president asked Congress to pass a jobs bill, calling job creation his number one priority. He also said lawmakers should not give up on passing health care reform. Some in Congress, though, have criticized the health care bill because they say it would require taxpayers to fund abortions. President Obama also made waves by calling for an end to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. This year, I will work with Congress and our military to finally repeal the law that denies gay Americans the right to serve the country they love because of who they are. It's the right thing to do. The Republicans don't want that measure repealed. Minority Leader John Boehner says it's worked very well and ought to be left alone. Pro-choice groups have been very critical of CBS in recent days for the network's decision to air a pro-life ad featuring college football star Tim Tebow and his mother. But now supporters of the ad are firing back. The president of the pro-life women's group, the Susan B. Anthony List, says critics are trying to keep women from hearing full information about abortion. CBS says the ad will air during the Super Bowl broadcast since it is, quote, responsibly produced. Well, parishioners at a New Jersey church are suing their diocese in hopes of stopping a proposed merger with another congregation. Reports say nearly 300 parishioners of St. Vincent Pilate Church in Haddon Township have filed suit against Camden Bishop Joseph Galante. Parishioners want the diocese to return $1.4 million that were donated to a parish building fund before the diocese announced the controversial merger. The European Union is condemning recent violence against Christians in Egypt and Malaysia. The European Parliament says the Egyptian government should guarantee people the right to freely choose and change religions and prevent any discrimination against them. That statement comes after Christians were gunned down outside a church earlier this month. Meantime, the EU has praised Malaysia's recent court decision to permit Christians to use the word Allah to refer to God and said attacks against places of worship should be thoroughly investigated. Seeing an image of the Virgin Mary inside the walls of a church is not exactly a rarity, but finding a water stain shaped like the Virgin Mary in the baptismal font is a little bit more unusual. It is happening, or it did happen, at one Virginia cathedral, and as Marie Coronel discovered, the site has brought a Haitian man to new heights in his faith. For some, the silhouette that resembles the Virgin Mary is nothing more but something interesting to look at. But for others, like Lamo Rick Laguerre, it's the ray of hope he's been searching for ever since the Haiti earthquake. I feel so hopeless. I feel sad. When I, discuss, I feel pain. I can sleep. His family lives in the section of the city where there's no power. And Lamel Rick says the only way to find them is to go there and do it himself. Reaching the lowest point he's ever been, Lamel Rick went to Mass at the Basilica of St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception in Norfolk. And it was there where someone pointed out the image that Father Ernest Belinda discovered inside the church's baptismal font. Instantly, Lamel Rick says he felt a connection with the image. I feel like you feel different, like I feel like I, what I sing, this cannot be. I say I think, I think like that I never see nothing like that in my life. 
Though there are many opinions about what this image shows, Lama Rick says what he sees has restored his faith. I have faith before, now I have more faith. And with faith in his heart, Lamel Rick says he's hopeful this image isn't just something interesting to look at, but instead a miracle in the making found in the silhouette of the Virgin Mary. Well, stay tuned. There's more currents coming up straight ahead. Just ahead, the guide to being a good mother may come from this book. We'll talk to the author. Welcome back. Well, it just might be about the hardest job in the world, but it's also the most gratifying. It's being a mom. Just ask my mom. She'll tell you. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. If I had, you know, if I had a dime for every time I gave my mom uh, just headaches, a I'm sure, time. as a child. I, there was actually one time when I was a kid, and I, it was during a very solemn moment in church. And like toward the end of a church service, I, of course, as you know, grew up in the Baptist church. And I, I just walked out of the, the pew. I, I apparently needed to go to the restroom or something. I was just a small kid, about five years old. And it had on these like cartoon character sunglasses and literally marched down the aisle of the church and right in front of the pastor mm -hmm. and out into the <laughs> thing. And so I'm sure, like I, I embarrassed my mom more than once, many times doing stupid things just like that when I was but a kid. But she still loves you. <laughs> I'm sure she does. I, actually, I know she does very, very well. <laughs> but for anyone who's had to deal with the ups and downs of parenting, whether it be kids acting up in church or whatever it may be, help is on the way. Uh, Lisa Hendy is the founder and editor of a popular website that's called CatholicMom.com and she's collected the wisdom that is gleaned from that website all into a new book called The Handbook for Catholic Moms. Uh, sort of Catholic moms or momhood for dummies yeah. I guess it is yeah, in a way. <laughs> Yesterday I had a chance to talk with her about her website, her book and her unique take on motherhood. Well Lisa, thank you so much for being with us here today on Currents. Thank you Francesca for the opportunity. Well, Catholic Moms, all right, for, for those of us who uh, may not be entirely familiar with your website, tell us a little bit about your experience as a Catholic mom. Well, the website was born just about 10 years ago, CatholicMom.com, and initially started as just sort of a single-page hobby kind of a thing for me. My husband at that time had not yet joined the church, and I was raising my two sons and really felt a need to provide uh, for myself and for others some resources that might help me grow in my own faith and build a community of supportive moms around the country. So it's really grown from there into what it is today. And, and how many people do you have visiting it today, and from where do they come? You know, last year we were blessed to have close to 2 million page views on the website, and literally from over 100 countries around the world, and we've got close to 70 contributors at this point who volunteer their writing every day of the week to provide great resources for Catholic families. Wow, that's great. And, and so that online venture has now turned into a book that you have coming out next month on February 8th, right after the Super Bowl. Tell us a little bit about what made you want to put it down on paper and not just online. You know, Francesca, it's a great question. And now that my sons are teenagers and I've been through some of the uh, what is commonly referred to as the mommy wars. Um, I really wanted to share some encouragement for Catholic moms out there uh, who are living out this wonderful vocation that we share. And we've tried to put together a resource that would be for any type of Catholic mom, whether that's an, a career woman, a woman who stays at home and homeschools her children, a stepmother, you know, an adoptive mom, all, all kinds of different things are referenced in the book. But really it's a book to support and encourage Catholic moms. And, and do you think that's what differentiates this book then about other books about motherhood because it's supporting a very, you know, particular faith and mothers in that faith uh, or there are unique tips in there that they might not find elsewhere that don't necessarily have to do with a particular religion? Well, there are a few uh, things about this book that differentiate it. The, the first three sections of the book probably are relevant to any mom out there, and those are the heart, uh, mind, and body sections of the book where we encourage mothers to really nurture themselves through their relationships, through the work that they do, whether that be inside or out of the home, and through proper, you know, health care and nutrition. And this is really not a book about, you know, taking care of your two-year-old, but rather taking care of yourself as a mother. 
But then that final section, the soul section, really deals with nurturing ourselves through the wonderful tools and treasures of our Catholic faith, and mm-hmm. that's really, I think, what sets it apart. And also the fact that we have so many contributors to the book who are in and of them and, their own right and that, And that's a great segue into what my next question was going to be, is how did you even um, get the different kinds of people that you have uh, contributing to the book in the book, and, and what do you think that they bring to the table? And if you want to share a few examples of who the authors are, feel free. Well, I'm so blessed to have made a lot of great relationships over the years through the website, and many of those are people who I've never met in person but who I greatly admire. So when the book was approved, I basically sat down and created what I'm calling a dream team of people (laughs) who I wanted to contribute for each chapter. And universally, when I went to them and asked them to be involved, they universally said yes and and voluntarily gave a, a piece of their writing to go in each of the chapters. So I strongly support the book, not only because I wrote it, but because all these noted experts are in there. People like Father James Martin, who wrote on the Saints, uh, and I believe you're familiar with his Mm -hmm. work. Um, Danielle Bean, who's a noted author. Uh, Heidi Hess Saxton is a great uh, adoptive parent expert. Uh, Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle wrote for us. So it's just really a conglomeration of great writers Talking, talking on topics that are very important to moms these days. And not only those noted writers, but also my Facebook friends, r- literally hundreds of not only moms, <laughs> but dads and priests, yeah, <laughs> contributed to the book and their stories and their quotes and their real life situations are part of this book. Right. And that's really what it is, is a handbook for real life and for real Catholic moms. And uh, we look forward to its publication uh, coming out next month, Lisa. Well, thank you so much for helping me to spread the word about the Handbook for Catholic Moms. Well, thanks for being on Currents today. And that is Lisa Hendy of CatholicMom.com. And I've also posted a little bit more about her and a link to her website over at our blog. You just have to go to CurrentsNY.net and click on Writing the Wave. And one of the things I liked that she said in the interview was that a lot of the things that she um, advocates for is that moms take care of themselves, that right. being a good mom is also about self-nourishment and nurture and uh, spirituality. Yeah, it's like, you know, you have to take, I guess, the two-pronged approach. You have mm-hmm. to take care of your children and you take care of yourself, physically, spiritually, and all of the above. Because, I mean, you know, you're, I, I think we see that a lot with, um, and I, I, you know, from watching documentaries and things about, you know, motherhood and all that in the past and seeing the interview now, uh, it's very evident that a lot of moms neglect to, to do just that, mm-hmm. to take care of themselves when they're taking care of their children. Mm-hmm. And for this particular book and, uh, you know, on the website too, she gets a lot of great contributors from, uh, you know, different walks of life with different perspectives right. and, and they kind of lend uh, different voices to the book. So I think for a wide swath of people, it will be appealing because it's uh, not just limited to one particular voice. So you may want to check it out. Like I said, I'll post more information on our blog. All right. Well, very good. Stay with us. There's more Currents coming up straight ahead. When we return, how one Queen's student hopes to make a difference in Haiti. It really hurt me just to see them like that, um, to see them so lost, to feel like there's no hope. And I want to tell them that there is hope. Aftershocks are still rippling through Haiti. Late on Wednesday, fresh tremors rocked the island nation, now damaging the south pier of Port-au-Prince, further hindering relief efforts. The most recent estimate puts the number of people who have lost their homes at up to one million. Mm. The need there is definitely great, and some here in New York are doing whatever they can, sometimes even in surprising and inspiring ways. Consider Ashley Torrenti. She's a sixth grader at Holy Family School in Flushing. She saw an opportunity to turn a birthday celebration into something much more, an occasion for gift giving that became itself a gift. That's why she is tonight's eyewitness. I want to do my part. Um, Some people say, oh, they'll they'll make it. And I'm like, no, they won't. Well, $600 were meant for my birthday. I was going to have a party with my friends. But I thought the people in Haiti needed this more than I did. When I saw everybody there, them crying, um, I remembered when my grandmother died. Um, I didn't know her. I never really met her. But even though I didn't know her, I still felt bad. I believe I was nine, eight or nine. And I didn't like seeing my mom hurt either. 
So in the case of Haiti and all the mothers, the fathers, and I heard a lot how the pastors died there, I felt really bad even though I didn't know them. Like my grandmother, I still felt for them. Um, in kindergarten, I did the same thing. I sent $5,000 and for the tsunami. A lot of people thought, no, we could just leave it. I didn't feel that way. I thought they needed some money. We have a lot compared to other people, and we should sometimes put them first. My entire life, I go to church every Sunday. I work in the choir. Um, I'm also an altar server. In the beginning, I wanted to become a sister or a nun, um, but I decided not to. Um, ever since I was in fourth grade, I wanted to become a writer. I really want to write mystery books and fiction books because I love them a lot. A lot of writers have inspired me. And I also like to write poems. Um, Robert Frost was one of the first poets that I read. And I just really liked it. He opened my eyes saying that there's stuff everywhere that you can write about. I definitely see Christ as a role model. I picture him as being a person who loves everybody. Um, him being forgiving and just wanting the best for everybody. And that's exactly how I feel. I would forgive any of my friends, my family, and I love them all. I would always give a second chance. I know there's always a second chance. I know he'd put others first. And I feel the same way. I know that others are more in need than I am. And I think he would agree with me that I'm doing the right thing. I would tell the people of Haiti that it really hurt me just to see them like that, um, to see them so lost, to feel like there's no hope. And I want to tell them that there is hope, that they're not alone, that there are people here that want to help them. Things are going to get better for them. I know it is. Just a remarkable, remarkable girl. What I really liked is that uh, even though she didn't know these people, she didn't know her grandmother, she made that connection. It really shows her heart sensitivity, her real commitment uh, within herself to see suffering and to see an opportunity to give uh, when there is a need. And she was able to do it and willing to do it despite her birthday plans. Right, right. And that's a lot, I mean, especially for a, a, a sixth grader to um, give up. You know, mm -hmm. because I mean, I remember as a kid, just always looking forward to having a great birthday party sure. every year. And she's like, you know what? It's just a party. I, yeah, I don't really need this. You right, know? exactly. And, 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 and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, the other thing she said is the hope and the, the, the fact that things will get better yeah. and that they are moving uh, forward. And now she's a part of that hope and faith. And she's trying to, in her young age, uh, showcasing really her wisdom there and reassuring people that um, there is going to be life after death and there is going to be a future. And even just yesterday, I think 15 days after the earthquake, right. they rescued yet another person alive from the rubble. So um, hope is is certainly alive. Definitely, it's definitely there and uh, that girl is wise beyond her years she because uh, she knows all about that hope and she's telling people about it and making a sacrifice for folks that she doesn't even she know. Is. Well for resources and places where you can give just head on over to our website it is currentsny.net and click on our blog there Riding the Wave you'll find a list of great and reliable organizations who are accepting donations. Well, that's it for this edition of Currents. Tomorrow, Lino Ruli, our good friend, <laughs> catches up with a familiar face here on Currents, Jesuit author, Father James Martin. And you might be surprised exactly what he reels in in his catch of the day. We always look forward to Lino. Meantime, remember, you don't even need a TV to watch Currents. You can always catch us online at CurrentsNY.net. So until next time, thank you so much for watching. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Have a great night.